So here's a group of people came in the room, totally skeptical, and, and some of them are sort of fearsome traditional enemies. And two and a half years later, they're actually getting some things done. Not easy, very, very tough discussions, but very productive. Second story I want to tell you is about uh, something called the Octetti Negotiations. And Keystone wound up sort of accidentally being appointed the lead facilitator of this project. Octetti is a mine that's been built at the top of the Fly River system in Papua New Guinea. It's a mine that was developed, explored and developed by BHP. It's a mine that at the time was the largest open pit mine. They were basically taking the top off a mountain. Papua New Guinea is one of the poorest countries in the world. It's one of the most interesting and amazing and culturally diverse countries and one of the richest ones in natural resources. It's one of the last frontiers. So at the Octetti mine, uh, they had basically tried to create a retaining system for all the rock waste. And they found out they couldn't do it. The retaining wall broke. Tons and tons of rock waste fell into the river. And the, and the mine said, we can't build this mine. We can't do it. It's going to pollute the river. And the government said, go ahead. We need this revenue. Because that mine produces 20% of the country's GDP. It presented a terrible sustainability dilemma for all the 60,000 people tribes, clans, different language groups living up and down the river. And so we were pulled into this almost by serendipity and asked to help facilitate what became another very long running dialogue. We found our partners in uh, Port Moresby, a very good planning firm to work with. We worked with a former chief justice as an independent observer. We brought in independent scientists. It was a, you know, I mean, it's a gold mine, right? So they have a lot of money. So we were able to uh, really do a project at scale and at level. And after several years, uh, a very difficult negotiation, the parties put together a $350 million package of compensatory actions, money into people's pockets, money into foundations for future revenues, monitoring systems, a whole series of things. Um, so all of a sudden, the notion that this is just an American thing says, no, this is, we can do things elsewhere. This is happening in lots of other cultures that you know about. The last case project, if you will, that I'll tell you about is something called the Endangered Species Act. And this, in some ways, illustrates the cunning lengths we will go to to try and bring projects to the table. And my colleagues at Resolve and Meridian and other organizations know that you have to do a lot of upfront work to, to really create the architecture and choreography for one of these projects. So this was on the Endangered Species Act. And parties on both sides, one of the uh, developers, forestry developers and one of the environmental groups, Defenders of Wildlife, said, you know, we think the time is coming to make some improvements to the way critical habitats are designated and dealt with and planned in the face of uh, claims over jeopardy. Eight, uh, we, we couldn't figure out how to get everybody to the table, so we went to a couple of prominent senators, uh, Republicans and Democrats, including uh, then-Senator Hillary Clinton, and they said, would this be valuable? She said, yes, this would be valuable. Would you write a letter to that effect? And on the strength of that letter, we put the process together. Got funding, got trilateral funding uh, from lots of parties. And eight months later, uh, about 50 agreements were reached, and half a dozen of those landed in the Farm Bill and in other places. So I've become convinced that we can do this work, but our challenge is how do we scale it up? How do we take it to scale? How do we really uh, push it up? And that's, that's the challenge. Because it's not that it's not happening. It is happening. But the question is, how do we make it happen bigger and wider and deeper? So just a few thoughts, and then I'm going to bring myself to a close here. Um, I think that there's some backdrop to this that we need to uh, take cognizance of. And one of those is kind of a, let's call it an emerging constant. And what we keep learning in these projects and when we don't have these projects is that the biggest problems we have, whatever they are, whether it's cleaner fuels or reducing waste or reducing poverty or un ending unnecessary armed conflicts, we can't solve those problems alone. No one sector can do this. Uh, they're just too complex, too far-reaching, uh, and too fast-moving. So we need to become, just like there are guerrilla warriors, we need to become guerrilla bridge builders, guerrilla peacemakers, guerrilla mediators, use your language as you want. Uh, 
no one of these sectors, whether it's government or industry or civil society, owns these problems. They belong to all of us. And what is private is increasingly becoming public, and what is public is becoming private. So we live in a, a sort of a messy, confusing, potentially creative arena where the work of us, sometimes sponsored by uh, companies, sometimes sponsored by government, sometimes sponsored by civil actors, and sometimes by everybody altogether, can uh, kickstart, catalyze these kinds of things. I don't think any single jurisdiction of any government owns all these problems. They can't solve them by themselves. You can't wall, communities even bolder, cannot wall itself off of these problems. Uh, so, so, and we also have learned that technical remedies by themselves are insufficient. We've got to have good social remedies, good political remedies, good economic remedies, and that requires conversation and negotiation. I, uh, somebody last night said something about teams. I don't know what the standard was you. Somebody said, I have teams, no, not a good example. I actually think they're a great example. They're a great example. And Miracle is just one of those good examples of that. Um, there's there's a, a real politique, if you will, of how you pull these together. And there are lots of different techniques and lots of different variations and lots of different things. But I'll just end by saying I think that there is maybe a deep ritual that we're tapping into. And the ritual has at least six pieces into this. So one of those is, think, go back to the tribes and what I saw on the river, and it's 25,000 years ago. And today on the river, I saw somebody else who looked different from me, who talked different from me. And we may have to fight with them because they look like they're coming into our fishing area or our hunting area. So this goes back to that, and it's just as pertinent today in this ritual. So the first piece of the ritual is all about contacts, early contacts preliminary possibilities, preliminary inquiries. Uh, some, somebody reaches out, or maybe it's some third party who can help people choreograph that. So that's the first piece of this thing, and there's lots of variation on it. The second piece of this ritual that happens over and over again at Octeti, in the Endangered Species Act, in the Green Products case, is a gathering. There is some sort of gathering, a coming together. Stories, there are stories. Uh, and sometimes the stories are very complicated and sometimes very assertive and angry narratives, but there are stories. And uh, sometimes that happens with very quietly, or sometimes it happens with great pomp and profile. The third piece of this is the telling of these stories and the elaboration of them. And this is where one party or one side or one faction or one tribe or one clan says, here's why these issues are on our mind. Here's the problems. Here's the concerns. Here's the hopes, here's the fears. Uh, and, they, and that gets laid out, and along with threats, along with sometimes uh, possibilities, but there's one side that tells a story. When the ritual works, the fourth phase is the retelling of the story by other people. Other views say, you know, I don't think the problem is that, I think it's a this. So there are other hopes, there are other concerns, there are other ideas, there are other fears, there are other issues that come on the table, so we have this kind of at least a dialectic, if not a trialectic, and lots of a, a quadrilectic. So we have lots of things, lots of parties, lots of factions. The fifth piece of this is some sort of, for lack of a better word, I'll just call it emergence. There's some emergence. Something happens. People start to get insights. They get to, uh, understandings. Uh, there's a glimpse of similarities and differences. Uh, most of all, there's human connectivity and communication and some level of relationship that takes place. And we know when that happens better and worse. And the sixth piece of this is when new pathways open up and people see third possibilities that they didn't see before. Uh, those possibilities emerge and those might be intellectual, relational, emotional, political. We don't know. They take different uh, you know, characteristics in different situations. I think there's an alchemy in that. There's a chemistry in that. Sometimes there's a magic in it, but not, not all the time. Um, there's a word that I'll leave you with, a phrase. It's called tertium quid. It's an old Latin concept that finds its way into Blackstone law. And it's basically this new possibility, this new thing uh, that is related in some ways to the old things, but it's distinct from those. And that's what we do in these dialogues, in our attempts to work these constellations. We try to find that new thing, however vague, however, however, however ambiguous. I'll leave you with one final thought. 
And that is uh, the words of uh, Lily Tomlin, the great American philosopher. Lily Tomlin said she believes, since we've been talking about the Pleistocene, she said she believes that human beings develop speech out of a deep need to complain. So there you go. And with that, make sure I set this up for my colleagues. What do you think? There you go. Okay. Thank you very much.